situations we are facing. The second is that we really need to develop the institutional frameworks around censorship, freedom of expression in an internet context. We believe that the Global Network Initiative is an important step there and we are looking forward to working with other new members within that project as well. And the third is that we shouldn't discount innovation and technology because they will be an important part, although they will not be a simple technical fix within this problem space. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to all five panelists for having really rolled out a very broad, I think, and a very, uh, very illustrative uh, picture of the situation that we're facing when we're talking about the freedom of expression space and cyberspace and those various mechanisms that are being applied to, to minimize uh, that space. We now have some 20, 25 minutes uh, for discussion. We're going to take your questions three at a time and then all five panelists will have a chance to, to react to your questions. They will also, and I will invite them to do so, have the opportunity to briefly uh, comment on each other's presentation should they wish so. Can I ask you to raise your hands uh, if you would like to have the microphone? And when you get it, please do identify yourself. Speak clearly into the microphone so everybody in the room can hear you. We have the first question over here. We can have a microphone about it. Thank you. Hi. I am Mohammed Abdullah from NTC, Sudan. Uh, my English, English is not my mother tongue, so I am uh, try to be clear. My question for uh, Mr. Robert from Free Internet and uh, for uh, my friend from Google. Uh, as a developing country, Sudan, uh, Internet is the uh, cheapest and rich source for information for us. Uh, my question, USA blocking some uh, useful sites from Sudanese users. So, uh, Mr. Robert, uh, do you include uh, in your study such type of uh, filtering from countries against other countries? And uh, for uh, Mr. Robert, uh, as a company, and business and uh, culture of open source and some things like this. What's your response for this type of blocking? Thank you. For Internet and Society in India, a question to the gentleman from uh, Freedom House. I was wondering whether the strategy of ranking countries and embarrassing them will actually result in policy change or do we need to take an alternative strategy? Uh, this is my question is for Isaac. Uh, Isaac, this is with reference to um, ICT in school education. Um, are children in China and schools uh, encouraged to use uh, the internet for uh, information and knowledge? Or what, what sort of, uh, are there only certain sites that they're allowed to refer to or what would you know about the situation? In terms of internet uh, censorship that might be taking place there, we do not, um, we, as I mentioned, we have an index uh, and a methodology um, and we're going to be doing a pilot study of 15 countries. Um, in those 15 countries, Sudan is not in the initial list for Africa. Um, if you, so it, it won't be there. Now when we uh, can expand our, our, our index so it can include Sudan, we'd be looking not only uh, issues of um, censorship, but also access, uh, the legal environment, um, and how it might be used uh, for a mobilization of its citizens. Um, so if you're interested in censorship, um, then um, you know, I would suggest that you get in touch with the folks from the OpenNet initiative um, um, who I believe are here at the IGF, um, and then they could probably tell you kind of more uh, information. Um, and so that they could probably tell you how it compares with other countries. Um, when we eventually get to do Sudan, uh, then we'd be able to see how it compares perhaps to other countries in Africa and to the world in general. Um, going to the second question in regards to uh, shaming and ranking, um, what we are going to do is we're going to use the same approach we use for our existing um, indices on freedom of the world and particularly freedom of the press. And we have, a, a, as I mentioned in my slide, we have a, a scale and the scale will rank countries into free, um, not free and, and, and a category in between. 
um, and we've been doing this for, for, for a long time. And the index is to be used to see how countries, what their current state is, and if over time um, they might be getting better or getting worse. Um, and so that's our approach that we've done uh, classically, um, and it seems to have been um, you know, quite used, and it's an index, and people are happy with it. So um, um, will it lead to change or not? Um, some countries um, tie their foreign um, aid assistance uh, to indices uh, like Freedom House and others. So if the country does not do well, um, it will have repercussions on them, and that's perhaps a good thing. Just a, a short comment on, on ranking. Uh, within the OSC, we do not do that. We, we call it you know, the, the, the beauty contest, but we are very happy that these indexes uh, exist. The usefulness of them, I think, is the greatest in environments where you have uh, agreed commitments, where countries really know what they are benchmarked against. And in that uh, respect, the uh, index provided by Freedom House, uh, probably the foremost uh, accepted index worldwide, uh, is, is, is very helpful to us, especially with those governments who want to have an improved media freedom uh, environment. I do believe that if a government doesn't want to listen, doesn't want to be engaged, then I guess uh, it, it might at times be counterproductive. But I believe that goes for all indices. Let me just say also from UNESCO that we, we do not do that kind of ranking either. We, as you know, we have 193 member states and they're all dispersed uh, on, on the full scale uh, of the Freedom House uh, Index. But we do, of course, base a lot of our work on these kind of indexes coming from several organizations. What we have done at UNESCO is that we have developed uh, our own media development indicators whereas the issues related to freedom of expression constitute a very, very important part of that. And we use that not so much to, to name and, and blame or name and shame, but we use it more to calibrate the kind of assistance that we think is the, the relevant or the appropriate assistance in the various countries where we are active. But I'll hand over to Niklas. Well, the comment I have is also actually on ranking, and I think that one useful thing with having, um, uh, even if you don't do the ranking, having the methodology behind that in order to be able to assess what kinds of factors within countries, for example, that companies should look at, is an extremely useful tool, and is also part of the need for, or part of the answer to the need for institutional framework development, I think. Just a, a quick comment. In the IFLA World Report, we, we don't rank. Um, there's an issue, I think, regarding shaming. We have in the past issued press releases um, pointing out internet censorship in certain countries, but we've actually moved away from that approach in that we certainly feel that librarians in, in China, for example, cannot be held responsible for the conditions under which that they are working. So we have actually adopted a different approach and we've moved towards more of an empowerment approach, training librarians to be aware of the issues and hopefully providing them with the information that they can use for advocacy activities. So we feel this is much more of an effective approach. Uh, if we study, you know, China internet censorship and some of those uh, impact to the educational system, I think, um, you know, it uh, could be a um, very hard, you know, uh, 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 situation because uh, many Chinese uh, schools they have installed uh, the filtering software already and um, they are now behind a new uh, 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 really restricted environment called China Education and Research Network CERNET you know this uh, system you, you know limit student to access um, the information uh, from the internet the globally so it's a kind of uh, system that can help the government to guide the content and which kind of content, which kind of resources they can, they can access. Uh, in another direction, you know, the, 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 the research and some of those learning materials cannot publish to the public internet as well uh, it, in some way. Um, you can use internet in your personal ways, but uh, if you uh, belongs to uh, maybe an ed educational institution. Uh, your papers, your 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 uh, uh, essays must be 
uh, reviewed and published under the, the, the guidance of the system. So it's still a very uh, closed system to the educational system. But that's why we are trying to define some initiatives in China to to reach the open education, you know, uh, declaration in, in Captain, you know, uh, the, the goals of the of the declaration, and uh, we just had the Chinese blog conference in Guangzhou uh, uh, two weeks ago, and there is a roundtable about the how to well use internet for educations, and uh, about thirty educator bloggers they stand there to define about 11 of them to use the internet. So I think we can see more changes from grassroots now, yeah. Thank you, we're ready for the next round. We start at the back of the room, there are two gentlemen and then there's a lady up here in the white shirt. The two uh, gentlemen at the back of the room. Actually, I've, oh, I've, you have, oh. yeah. Trade offs involved uh, in companies uh, operating and entering uh, uh, into business in countries where some sort of filtering or uh, censorship may be required as a, as a prerequisite for operating in those countries. Thank you. And on Tarek Sneeti, I'm from the Side Business School in Oxford University. I have a question for Isaac. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation and I was intrigued by the, um, the, the slide on the brain model. And I just wanted you to explain to me uh, uh, the, the, the kind of message from that slide because I did not quite get it. Are you suggesting that we should compare coping mechanisms uh, to a brain structure or are you suggesting that in order to understand how people cope with, uh, with uh, censorship in China we should look at the kind of neuro affective chemical uh, uh, reactions in their brains because there are, there are, these are two different lenses I believe and there is a lot of research now being done on, on the brain on how people react to things like uh, marketing and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you. From DN Forum and I9 Holdings, I also have a question for Isaac. Actually, two questions. First of all, uh, when the, the Tibet issue right before the Olympics happened, uh, there were a lot of reports outside, I'm sure you must have monitored, about the patriotism and some, uh, you know, blogging being done against the Western media and every media that this is like a bias against China. Now, how much effect do you think the 50 Cent Brigade is having on it? And was it like really the general people who were having it? Or was it like uh, what you mentioned as 50 Cent Brigade? Secondly, my question is about uh, the you know, uh, anti-filtering um, software like Tor, which I know Wendy Selzer also works on. So what sort of action does government take against the people trying to propagate this? And like, uh, I'm sure like uh, if this is a kind of thing which uh, uh, essentially helps you uh, be more free, uh, then a lot of people who want to be free use it, but the government certainly doesn't want it. So uh, what sort of actions is the Chinese government taking against this stuff? Thank you. And the Mr. Chapman, I'm representing ENACSO, uh, an alliance of children's rights NGOs from Europe, and also NSPCC, a UK child protection NGO. Just a couple of questions. Um, one to the speaker from Freedom House. Um, I was in interested in your index, and I was just wondering whether um, the issue of images of child sexual abuse is a not acknowledged in that index as a particular type of content which might be filtered or blocked. Um, and the other question to the speaker from the Libraries Association. Um, I was interested uh, in what you said about um, problems with um, filtering for, for children. Um, and just wondering whether, um, in terms of a response to that, is this, uh, I think education of librarians must be one um, very important response. Do you also see an issue around a lack of more sophisticated filtering tools? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, of uh, censorship is, uh, I think, is not only applied to Chinese people. It can be applied to uh, all educational and uh, cultural background because we set up a lot of rules for people to obey it. And maybe not all the rules are bad, but the problem to the education and to people's perception is that if we set more and more rules in our society, and the creativity will definitely lose. And for the censorship systems study, uh, 
because the technical censorship system is there, you know, uh, especially in China, uh, you can you can see that you over uh, 10,000 web uh, identified uh, web web URLs were blocked, and uh, you can see that there are a lot of keywords, you know, uh, were filtered. Uh, and uh, just in, in just yesterday, you can see that uh, some of those uh, uh, news websites were, were blocked again, reblocked. So the thinking model in, pe in, in sensors' mind and the thinking model in, in people who, who is being censored, you know, it's very interesting because uh, even the censor, the, the, there are a lot of websites were not censored and the thinking model in people's mind will try to avoid of, uh, accessing some websites they think that they should not access. So it's a kind of um, uh, interesting study to see that people, how people in China, you know, they are building their own thinking cage, you know, all, the, all of the time. So there was ever a report to say that the Great Firewall system, you know, actually it definitely exists. But the big, bigger problem is that people will try to build their own self-censorship in their mentality. So it's a kind of problem. And we can say that how to resolve it is one of my research interests as well. Because uh, we can see that if people uh, uh, access internet, more and more they will trust some uh, 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 friends or maybe some of their surroundings content. Um, like uh, they, they will subscribe their friends, blogs, RSS, etc. So they, it can be seen as a new pipeline, and people can access some really uh, relevant information. You know, we, in this way, so we can see that it can help people to remove some of the blocks in their in their um, uh, uh, neuron circles, and uh, we can overcome some of these problems. So it's a um, it, it's a research topic, as actually. And another question about the Chinese, uh, uh, that, that, uh, related to the Olympics and the uh, and bears about the, uh, uh, from the uh, Western media, you know, there, there was a website called ntcn.com, uh, was built by a China student before the Olympics and just after the riots in Tibet. Uh, and the guy actually, um, got, uh, used a picture, you know, on CN website, which were cropped to uh, uh, from the original picture to uh, give people uh, some hints that uh, the China military they are trying to crack down people's protests there in Tibet. But the, the 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 so the guy, you know, he got very angry about CNN and he built the website to to say that oh. Uh, all the Western media is like CNN, you know, they are, they have a, a, a very big um, bears about China and, and the policy to Tibet, etc. And he got a lot of supporters uh, in, in just in one week, the website, uh, uh, his uh, increased a lot that week. But after that, you know, uh, about three to four weeks later, you know, the website returned to to silent because they cannot provide more evidence about the bears. And uh, more bloggers started to reflect this phenomenon because they think that two people in China, they cannot see, see CN actually. And, uh, uh, and how can they tell how Western media give bears to this country? If there are many bears to this country, we should try to put things together to try to uh, make some uh, 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 holistic judgment about this situation, not just take one picture uh, to in this situation and uh, judge it as a stereotype. So I think it's a kind of uh, change, uh, also a good thing to Chinese people to learn how to think independently. So I didn't see, you know, the website has more meanings after several months of uh, existing. So the website, not right now, is very, very uh, uh, low-tuned, yeah. Um, I'm gonna stick with the, the library's question. Um, will the, there will undoubtedly be more sophisticated internet um, filtering software made available 
um, libraries are a, are a big purchaser, um, and they will, uh, we will undoubtedly be targeted uh, for buying this material. But every single librarian I've met who has internet access in their library has a teenager on the library computer story, which generally involves the teenager completely bypassing all filtering software controls and doing exactly what they want on the computers. Um, my worry is that even as the software becomes more sophisticated, it'll, it can still be circumvented, and I'm not convinced that the problems of overblocking and underblocking will go away. So, therefore, education is our main focus, uh, librarian education, and I would like to think that in future we might be able to um, perhaps merge with education in the schools so that librarians and kids actually meet somewhere in the education program. So that's our policy on it. So I'd like to address a question from the uh, gentleman at the Technology Policy Institute. Um, I think that the trade-offs involved in um, deciding to go into a market where you could be required to do some kind of censorship or filtering are enormously complex and many. That's why we established the Global Network Initiative. There are a couple of things that are fairly obvious that you need to think about. Among those are the possibility for you to protect your users. So. I mean, if there's a censorship regime in place and you think that there could happen something if somebody tried to violate it, you need to be able to sh be sure that you can protect your users and those that um, subscribe to your services, for example. And that's like one of the first things you need to be sure of. Second is that you need to require kind, some kind of legal grounds, of course, for filtering and adducing. We would like to see that happen under rule of law. And I think that another important thing you would like to have the opportunity to do is to offer transparency um, so you can show up censorship when it, uh, when it is applied. You can really make it visible. This is important not only because you want to make it visible for your users, of course, but also because that will push other service providers within the country to do the same thing. You can compete, actually, on transparency, which in a sense uh, will increase transparency throughout other services too. So, so those are some of the concerns. Uh, it's a lot more complicated than that, but I, I think that within the Global Network Initiative we have, have a good chance of working that out. I'd uh, like to perhaps uh, answer uh, two of the questions. The first one is, is actions taken by government to, um, I think it was prevent um, anti-circumvention um, tools. Uh, some of the things being used. I, I believe some of that's being followed by the Open Net Initiative. Um, the other thing, too, is uh, Freedom House's uh, Internet Freedom Project uh, has uh, Internet Freedom Alert, where we try to track uh, developments Internet freedom. And so as we spot uh, news related to incidents, but also um, issues of either new tools or uh, actions being taken by governments, um, you know, we'd be spotting that. I haven't... Um, I, I can't recall anything right now, uh, so I'd, I'd have to look. Um, probably the, the folks from the Open Net Initiative here uh, might be able to have a, a, a better answer. Uh, but I want to focus, I guess, my reply more on the issue of uh, child protection and if it's included uh, specifically um, in our index. Um, if I recall well, it is not, but we, what we do um, have is um, we do recognize that in certain parts of the world, um, um, certain countries uh, have a culture where a certain type of content uh, might be, um, the society might choose for, for that to be blocked. And so then what we would look at is, well, what was the process uh, taken behind to make that decision? Um, what type of framework? What type of laws? What type of regulation? What was the discourse in the country? If there is um, censorship, then how transparent um, is it? Um, is there due uh, recourse if stuff is blocked by mistake? what are unintended consequences, and those systems that are put in place, um, then what privacy and surveillance implications might that have for the population. Um, then also, if that's an issue, then what are alternatives to censorship that might be available? So for example, um, education or not, uh, what are statistics, um, and what is the discourse? So does the citizens of the country generally agree or not about it, and so we would, you know, we would put that in. So having a specific item um, against um, or related to the issue of child protection would not cover uh, the broader issue um, that some societies um, just have different, different norms, and I think the example was made earlier in regards to hate speech and how that varies from, from countries to countries, and different countries might have different views on, on child protection and um, how that whether it should be censored or not, and if it is, what approaches should be taken. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we are running out of time, but I have promised uh, one last question to be raised. It's from here, from the second row. Could we get the microphone up here, please? And my question about filtering in libraries. Uh, you know, uh, in Russia, we are going to implement uh, the strategy uh, of installing filters in libraries. And I'd like um, uh, to notice, according to the world experience of the most developed countries in this um, field, uh, what are the most effective uh, mechanisms of um, influencing the providers and uh, libraries? So, uh, to uh, implement uh, uh, such uh, filtering system, and uh, uh, what uh, uh, is uh, the context, internet con uh, content to be uh, filtered? Because uh, um, it's possible to filter uh, only child pornography, or it's um, uh, possible to filter uh, aggressive content in general, uh, according to the world experience. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Stuart. It's for you, I think. Um, this, this is a, a, a very timely question, I think, because in 2009, IFLA will undertake a, a very large project in Russian libraries to um, hold our internet workshops uh, on the internet manifesto to bring in some education for Russian librarians about exactly what the implications of using this, uh, this software is. Um, in my experience of, of Russian libraries and filtering and the, in the exact content uh, which is being filtered. Um, we, cer we certainly don't see it as a question of what content you should filter. Um, I think it, uh, it's, it's more, a, more of a case of um, there will be filtering on the ISPs that libraries will have to deal with if we're talking about imposing extra filtering software on the actual local area networks or on the computers themselves, then um, obviously the level of settings that come with that filtering software is something that need to be looked at by Russian librarians. Um, and perhaps if it is going to have to happen, and very often it does have to happen as mandated by law, um, we need to make the policy makers aware of what exactly libraries' job is and what our responsibilities to our users are. So I'm quite pleased to be able to say that in the case of Russia, we will be there in 2009 on a very wide scale working with the Library Association to actually explain to our Russian colleagues what it is that we feel librarians should be doing and what they should be standing up for, and also providing some examples and some tools that they can take to their network administrators at the bottom end or even to local politicians to explain to them how important it is that we try and make the access as, as free and open as possible. So I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards about what we're going to do. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have certainly in this session been, uh, been exploring very well the, the full potential of the internet for what at UNESCO we normally use to call the 3Ds for development, for democracy and for dialogue. And I think we have seen how that potential is at the same time as it is being trying to be controlled by, by some governments, it is, has this very, very inbuilt, free and slightly anarchic character. Isaac's uh, um, image of the Tom and Jerry uh, situation with the internet and, and those who want to control it or restrict it I think is, is probably a very correct uh, illustration of, uh, of, of the matter as it is right now. But I also fully agree with him that this is not a satisfactory situation. I think we should all, and definitely intergovernmental organizations like UNESCO, like the OSE, like the Council of Europe, I think we have a responsibility to provide to governments advice on how to develop legal and regulatory frameworks, how to design policies that are conducive to freedom of expression when it comes to internet regulation, and that allow for that regulation to be based upon solid human rights, uh, a solid human rights basis. I think it also will be up to us to put together and, and distribute several uh, examples of best practices so that they can be used, taken up uh, by all of those around and also then, that's the final remark, to keep on organizing these kind of events, these kind of discussions, bringing together the industry, the governments, the NGOs, the media, everybody involved in this, trying to make them sit around the same table and discuss the, those issues. In that sense, the Internet Governance Forum and its uh, multi-stakeholder approach is a very important issue. With this, I would like to thank you very much for having spent the last two hours with us, and uh, I'd like you to join me in a round of applause to the brilliant panelists and to yourself as well for your active participation. Thank you.